He told Sam Cohen, the inventor of the neutron bomb, the following. I'll tell you what war is about, he told Mr. Cohen. You've got to kill people, and when you kill enough of them, they stop fighting. Did you hear that? As a judge said about him later on, very few people can really tell the truth, and most people really don't want to hear it. Okay, he did. So did Sherman. People don't want to hear that kind of blunt honesty. You hear that? And so if you add blunt honesty to a brutal sense of realism and a strong devotion to the nation, what you have is Curtis Lee May. I'll read you more from this uh, on the Savage Nation when I come back. The life and wars of Curtis, General Curtis Lee May, for one reason. It's because he was the most roundly criticized by the radical leftist vermin who criticize every American patriot today and instead extol the lowest of the low like Michael Jackson and Senator Al Frankenstein. I'll be right back. <laughs> Borders, language, and culture, you care about these things. I tell you why they're important. The Savage Nation, weekdays 3 to 7 on Talk 910 KNEW. You're listening to an encore broadcast of the Michael Savage Show. Yeah, I'll do the news of the day, but you know, it was July 4th week, and I can't let it go without talking about a great American general, Curtis LeMay. The book is Life and Wars of General Curtis LeMay, Warren Kozak. I highly recommend it. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit more in a minute, but I, I found a page in the book that I have to read to you because it shouldn't be lost to my audience or to history. Page 243, Brutal LeMay, okay? Quote, the Japanese saved their greatest venom for the B-29 crews that parachuted from stricken planes. Captured B-29 airmen were shot, bayoneted, decapitated, burned alive, or killed as boiling water was poured over them. Other aircrew members were beaten to death by civilians and shot with bows and arrows, then decapitated. Perhaps the most appalling episode, according to historian Richard Frank, took place when the Western Japan Military Command gave some medical professors at Kyushu Imperial University eight B-29 crewmen. The professor cut them up while alive in a dirty room with a tin table where students dissected corpses. They drained blood and replaced it with salt water. They cut out lungs, livers, and stomachs while the airmen were alive. They stopped blood flow in an artery near the heart to see how long death took. They dug holes in a skull and stuck a knife into the living brains to see what would happen. There was a real fear that the Japanese would execute all prisoners if it looked like they were going to be liberated. To a man, allied POWs believed the Japanese would kill them if the homeland was invaded, and surviving written documentation supports this belief, footnote number 20. It's worth noting that this was in the background of the minds of the American men who were fighting World War II, as opposed to what is the rubbish that's been fed into the minds of the American children today by the radical communist left who are teaching them. Read the book. Read your historians rather than your historical revisionists. This is the Savage Nation. Met LeMay in person, Scott San Francisco. Kenny W, go ahead, please. Hey, Michael, this is Scott. Uh, yeah, 1982, I was getting ready to go into the Air Force to uh, officer training school. My dad was commander of the Air Command and Staff College at Maxwell Air Force Base, Alabama. God which bless is in him. Montgomery. And they had a what they call a gathering of eagles and had a a gathering of uh, former World War One, World War Two, Korea, and Vietnam aces, uh, and people who made aviation history. Mm. And one of the people who got to meet, I got to meet quite a few World War Two aces, and I got to meet Curtis LeMay, and uh, he came over to our house for breakfast. Really? And, uh, yes, he did. And he, uh, him and his wife, were really, really nice. He's a very humble man. But what they did, they made an Air Force Now film. Uh, in our living room, on our quarters at Maxwell Air Force Base, and interviewed him. And he, I remember very distinctly sitting in a uh, wing back chair in our living room. And he was, was he a gruff kind of guy, or he was not like that in your presence? Yes, he was a gruff kind of guy. He was a small guy. I would say he probably wasn't much taller than maybe like five foot eight, and kind of burly. And uh, I remember him smoking his old corn cob. It was kind of funny. Scott, I want to ask you something since you triggered that, that idea. I understand many jet pilots are not much taller than that because of the tightness of the cockpit. Is that true? 
You know, a lot of them are small guys, but surprisingly, I did meet some big guys. Uh, one that strikes me is Robin Old, who was an ace in Vietnam, hmm. and he was probably six foot three. Oh, I I watched that movie on um, uh, not, what was it called? It was a sequence done on um, battles in the sky or something with digital reproductions of the actual battles. I could not believe the kind of combat missions that were flown against each other, going back to uh, you know World War II. Then, of course, Korea, then the Vietnam era, the, the Israeli Air Force, the kind of combat that, what do you call it, when they fight each other in, in jet pilots, what do you call it? Dog fights, dog fights. There's a, there's a DVD series called Dog Fights that are amazing. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Hey, let me ask you, you were in the Air Force, Scott. Did you fly in Vietnam? No, I was not in the Air Force. I was, I was a, a munitions supply officer working with the first B-1 bomber base in uh, Dias Air Force Base, Texas. Uh, the reason I ask is I want to pay special note to a friend's father. Um, Jason, if you're listening, Jason May's father was a man who flew 200 combat missions in Vietnam. I never met the man, but his son gave me, his, his actually his mother gave me her deceased husband's drinking cup from Thailand where the base was, which I, I just have it as, as a, one of my possessions. I consider it one of my great possessions. Anyone who could fly 200 combat missions in Vietnam and survive, to me, is one of the great heroes of my life. They won Sky Raiders in Vietnam, uh, 1965 and 66, and uh, he did his 200 missions. Who, who did? Uh, my dad, my father. Amazing. Well, my hat's off to, to him and to all the other brave men who saved us from the uh, uh, Nazis in World War II. Thank you very much for that call. This is the Savage Nation. We're talking about real Americans as opposed to the vermin that are extolled by the salenterates in the media. You could look up the word salenterate. It means animals without backbones. But even amongst animals without backbones, there is an ascending and descending scale. And so not all salenterates are bad. Savage. Talk 910 KNEW. Here's Michael Savage. <laughs> Show. Hartford, Connecticut, Mark, you're on the Savage Nation. Go ahead, please. Dr. Savage, Curtis LeMay was as feared by the Russians as General Patton was by the Germans before the D-Day invasion. He pushed the envelope. He sent bombers. He sent spy planes. He was constantly probing the Russian borders. He flew missions into Russian territory constantly, and he was always trying to see what their capabilities were. And now let's go back to Vietnam for one reason. He served under, Je under uh, McNamara, who just died today, uh, was the uh, man who basically caused the American military to lose in Vietnam. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. My father right. was. And what's interesting is that McNamara was once junior to LeMay, but after World War II, when they no longer had any use for the real warriors, they put McNamara above him, and McNamara then became defense secretary under Kennedy. And it was McNamara who fought a war that he had to lose. In fact, LeMay said, you're going to lose this war because you're fighting a limited war. You can't fight war any other way other than either go for it or get out of there. That's what he said. Either just bomb them into the Stone Age or leave Vietnam. It was LeMay who said that. My father was in Vietnam uh, and Cambodia from 1958 to 62 with the Air Force. They told him to wear T-shirt and jeans and carry an unloaded M14. And he told his sergeant, I'm not carrying an unloaded rifle. You either give it to me loaded. And that was all due to McNamara. My father sent me an email today, and he was celebrating the death of, of Robert McNamara because he said he killed more American men in Vietnam than the Chinese and the Viet Cong did. Well, I agree. Between Henry Kissinger and Robert McNamara, we lost in Vietnam, and we've never recovered from that defeat. Though, add to that Walter Cronkite, a distinguished member of the Salenterate Press. Yes, sir. And you well, know you know what? What I do on this show every day until I'm stopped, until they put me out of business, I am going to tell the truth on this program as much as it may hurt people to hear it. The name of this show is Veritas, the truth, and I thank you for listening to it. The unadulterated, the unvarnished truth 
on the Savage Nation. Like it or not, here I am. Like it or not, this is the truth. This is the world that you live in. And, of course, we need men like that back in the military. I'm sure they exist somewhere down in the ranks, but where are they at the upper levels? We still, in essence, have a peacetime military because we are, in essence, at peace. After all, the men are only dying in Afghanistan. North Korea is firing missiles into the, uh, into the ocean. Uh, Iran is threatening to blow uh, Israel and then the United States off the map. The world is in upheaval, and Obama doesn't care. He doesn't know that. He assumes it's still the University of Chicago and that he can go to another seminar on a peaceful world without nuclear weapons.